Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this person next to me is a comedian, an actor, an author, a costume designer from back in the day, and of course, she's an icon. She's a legend, Bianca Del Rio. You know her, of course, as the winner of season six in RuPaul's Drag Race, which is almost 10 years ago now. Of course, you know her every time you send a Not Today say meme to somebody. She is listed as one of New York Magazine's most powerful, you were the most powerful drag queen. In at America. the time. At the time. At the time. At the time, like four years ago. Yeah. Um, and now she is going out on tour, US and Canada, and it's called Dead inside. I love it. Okay, let's talk about the tour. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Oh my God, thank you for coming. And you did all of your research. I did I, I did as much research as I can, and I even recognized the nod to I Love to Lucy. Lucy. We to talked Lucy. about earlier, yes. I love the nod to Lucy. I did too, you know, but Killing red it. hair I wear, and like, I don't think red looks good with red, so I didn't wear red hair today, but I do enjoy the red hair. I do try to mix it up with what I'm wearing each time. So I stick with the basic hair colors and then add the color elsewhere. All right, I mean, they say redheads can't wear red. I, yeah. as a redhead, disagree with that. But your red is pretty. Your red's a natural red. Whereas Lucy red is we. I don't like it with this tomatoey red. I, you're Does kill, that make sense? You're killing it. You're oh, well, thank you. Because you. you're making it your own. There you so are. So you're there absolutely you are. killing it. So now let's talk about it. Let's talk. Because you're getting you. You've done so many tours in the past. You yeah. love being out on the road. And you've been out on the road recently. You were just in Brazil. Yes. But what is what is Dead Inside? What is this going to be? Well, Dead Inside is my sixth world tour that I'm doing. And I know every, we've been posting and, and we just announced that it's a world tour and everyone's saying America and Canada is not just the world. I agree. But we've just announced the first leg of the tour. So it's our first 60 cities, which start on February 12th in San Diego, and we'll go through all over America and Canada. Um, and it's just my, my opportunity to get back on the road. And I don't know if you knew this, but this past year, some acts by the name of Beyonce, Taylor Swift, you might have heard of them, were on the road. And I thought, I'm not going to tour. I thought, let's give these girls an opportunity to go out and make a couple dollars. So, so I generous. took time off. I took time off so that they could do it. And this other one, you might know, Madonna. Yeah, she's doing something. So I'm waiting a little bit till she's halfway through and then I'll start mine in February. Yeah, because I'm considerate like that. Um, incredible. So what is the structure of this? What are you What are you thinking about? I mean, you, I know you can't say too much because well, you don't want to spoil it, but what are you thinking about? You also, you prepare and then you also like to freestyle. Oh, when you, you have to. Yeah. You have to. Well, because especially the world moves so quickly. So for instance, all of this is in motion for me to do a tour, let's say maybe six months ago. And so we're plotting and planning and heading up to the event. And there's lots of material that you write, especially I had about a year off, uh, which was a great year to be off to do television and film work. Ha 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 ha! So that didn't happen. Um, but what was crazy is that I said, yes, let's do it. And what my process is, you have nuggets and moments and notebooks of pages of stuff that you write and create throughout the year. And then as you get to February, so much happens, so much changes. So you have to be on the pulse of all of it. Also, when you're in different countries, different things matter to them. So for instance, if you're making a joke about the American government, they don't give a shit over there in the UK. So you have to find your balance. So for me, it's a set of always go in with more material than you think you will need. And then you see how it flows and you adapt each night. Now you talked about how things are always in motion and things are changing. Yes. One thing that has changed a lot in just the past year, 18 months, is the state of LGBTQ rights oh. in our country. Crazy. Don't say gay laws, mm -hmm. drag bans, mm -hmm. drag bans. It's, it's, this is the thing. I said, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through quite a bit. You know, when I was younger, we were concerned with AIDS when it was a major ordeal and everyone was saying at the time, you're going to die. This is the way it goes. And then it was all about protecting yourself and different elements have kind of come and gone. But I've always thought being gay, I was fortunate enough because many of my friends that were older had experienced it much worse th than I did. But I thought, you know, we had our places, we had our bars, we had our drag brunches. And now it's getting serious because when you take away a mimosa from a gay person at a drag brunch, this is some serious shit. This is fighting words. Don't take our brunch. It's all we have. You know, let our drag queens perform and let us have a good time. That I'm just mystified that this is a topic or that this is even a discussion at this point. Like, I pay taxes. I live my life. I pay taxes actually for a lot of things that, I, that are not my life. Uh, you know, schools and children and things in my neighborhood that I have to contribute to and property taxes. But yet, I don't get into the middle of their lives and say, this is what it should be and this is what it shouldn't be. So it blows my mind that that's even a topic, but of course, we're in a political year, so it just becomes this crazy, how do I explain it, this crazy world and, and, and tries to provoke so many of us to say, this is important, where it's really not important. And if it doesn't work for you, fine, go live your life. Don't go to brunch. 
Right, but then it does become political when you're out there going and playing in these states. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How does that change for you as a performer, knowing that you are going into states where you're welcome in the community, you're welcome yes. in the venue, people are excited to see you, yes. and yet maybe there's a governor who is trying to actively shut down the kind of work you do? <laughs> well, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky situation, and so you have to create that space. I'm fortunate enough that I'm not you know, participating in a brunch on the street where there, a lot of the laws are problematic or not well defined when it's dealing with a restaurant or a space that's not suited. Because I'm in a theater, I think I gravitate to the people that are there. And the fact that the people are there to show up, that's who I'm there to entertain. You know, you can't change a governor's mind. And if they don't like you, they don't like you. So the point I guess I have is to, or, or the, the job I have, is to entertain the masses that are there and maybe think outside the box so that we can actually vote these people out. And that's where it begins. You know, I think comedy is a big source of um, not only inspiration, but basically just voicing what's going on in the world. And I try to do that, you know, as I travel. I want to ask you about the comedy. You've been yeah. you've been called the Joan Rivers of drag. You say That's you, a huge compliment. You, which is which you've earned. You've described yourself as kind of a, a old school Hollywood meets Don Rickles. Yes. It's you you have that insult to comedian lane that you yeah. stayed in and yet you have to it's a very delicate needle to thread because you have to be able to be sassy and funny and read people for filth while also keeping them on your side oh of course how do you do that well i'm the biggest joke there is i mean look at did you think i mean the choices i've made in my life would i never would have thought i would have ended up like this so for me i'm a joke i'm a joke in general and that's how i present it and it's almost as though let's laugh at the world together because this is insane you know for many years i performed in bars uh in gay bars and in theater and so the the platform that drag race gave me it was putting you into a different world and you're like oh wait a minute i can go on the road and i can create a show and people can come and see it i don't know if they're going to like it i don't know what their opinions are but the platform was a television show because tv is a very powerful thing so it gave me this this chance to go out and what's interesting is that i tried so many different other ways of presenting myself because I thought, well, now I'm on the main stage, so I need to do this, I need to do that. And what you end up scaling it down to, and it's really funny because I'm sitting here in a wig, but it ended up being myself, you know, and that's what people gravitate to. So, um, yeah, it, it's that's kind of the balance for me is knowing that I'm the joke and that we're there to laugh in this moment at that time. But I have to find humor in everything. I mean, I'm laughing at a funeral. I don't know if that happens to you. Do you do that? Of course. Oh, yeah. Okay, it happens. You know, and you, you should. can't help it. You should. I agree. If you if you loved the person yes. and you're with the people you love, mm -hmm. then I hope you're sharing laughs. Always. And I'm always complaining to the person I'm with going, this bitch died and she owes me $20. <laughs> like, like, that is rude. That is rude. Just dropping dead, owing me money. That's some shady shit. <laughs> it is. Yes. I, they probably did it just to. Of course just they to get did. Out, I don't want to pay her. Just to, just to get out pay paying back your debts. But you also, you do have people who take it seriously. Yes. You have dealt with hecklers. Oh, yeah. I want to know how you manage it because we all have haters in our lives. Of course. I, had, I dealt with one this morning. I oh, had no. A, I had a hater this morning. I don't want to get into it, but I had yes. a hater this morning. Was it a hater online or an actual hater, it was a hater in, person. in person? It was a hater in, in person. person. It was an in-person hater. But okay, he, but I forgot I'm in New York today, but, so yeah, that's so you, you have it. But like, how do you do, like, how, what can we learn from you about how to deal with the haters in our lives and the hecklers in our lives in a way that is, lightens it up, brings the humor, but also gets in that last word. I think it's important to let them talk because when you realize that buffoons uh, really don't really have a point, they'll say something trivial like, well, you're a man. I mean, this is just, let's say the comment section on Instagram. You post a photo and someone will come in who doesn't follow you, who has six followers themselves. And I'm not saying that matters. I'm just saying this is just to give you context. So a person that's probably not even a real account, the photo, profile photo is a little anime picture, and they'll say, but you're a man. And you think, now, do I take the energy to explain to this person, yeah, I'm aware, yeah, I, I know what's going on here, or do I just allow them to go and allow everyone else online <laughs> to go after them? And that's kind of what I've learned, is to not entertain them on that level when it comes to the real world people. I was in Palm Springs, because where I live, and I was literally at a stop sign, and uh, a guy on a golf cart, because this is what happens in my neighborhood, a gentleman over 70 in a golf cart just zooms on by. So I made my right turn to go into my driveway. Well, he zipped back and wanted to inform me that that was a stop sign. And I'm thinking, 
Yeah, you son of a bitch. I was at the store. I, st I saw you. You almost killed me. No, no, that's diabetes. But I'm thinking to myself, what is the point of this? Like, let him rant, let him yell, and he did. And I just thought, there's nothing as cruel as I could say is that what God's going to do to him soon. He's going to drop dead. So let him have his moment. Let him unleash his demons. But in the end, I'm thinking, who does that? Who drives and then drives back to say, that was a stop. That's a lot of fucking energy. It's a lot of energy. That really is. So in those instances, I don't entertain them. Now, at a show, I love it because they usually give you so much information, you know? And when I was touring the last time, it was right after after COVID. So I, one of my big questions to them is, what did you do during the pandemic? Like, how did you make your money? I mean, obviously you couldn't have been a hooker because you're not that attractive. So those types of things happen and they're usually in on it with me. So I think now that people are paying to come see me, um, the hecklers are a little more tame. And I just try not to entertain the ones online because it's endless. It you sounds know? like it's idea. endless. But also, you you look at it. For instance, if I'm on the street, you know, as I came over here, there were several looks that came my way. But it is New York, so they're kind of immune, immune to this. Because um, we're dead inside. Completely. And if something were to happen, or if somebody were to say something, then instead of me getting angry, I go, mm, "That's a story I can use." You know. So it all becomes part of the act. <laughs> Everything is copy. Everything is. Everything is copy. I want to ask you, you, you mentioned, of course, Drag Race. Yes. It changed your life. Yeah. It also changed the culture. Yeah. I want to ask you about that because you were one of the early winners. You've talked about what that show did in terms of showing drag to the world and showing the drag culture, but also who the drag queens are, the people behind the yeah. the eyelashes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the person standing behind those eyelashes yeah. and underneath that wig. How do you think it's changed now? It's like we're, we're 15 years in, whatever. How has it changed what, how we understand not just drag, but identity. Well, it's it's a tricky thing. You know, I, as I said, I was around at a time where gay men only performed drag in gay bars or in theater. We were very limited in spaces. So to see this huge platform that has changed my life, that puts drag in people's living rooms, there's amazing perks to it all. You know, I mean, I'm sitting here with you because of this scenario. Um, but in the end, there's also the downside. You know, we have social media, we have everybody with an opinion. We've got people telling you that you're right and wrong. People are saying that now drag is homogenized. So I think it is a tricky scale, you know, that we deal with. But in overall, in the end, it's kind of amazing. I mean, I, I didn't expect it to be as exposed and well liked, but also I didn't expect to be banned in Florida, <laughs> you know? So you, it's it's insane the levels that we are experiencing. But overall, I think it's important to hear our stories. And for me in particular, when I did the show, I think I had done drag at that point 18 years. So no one ever asked or cared what I looked like out of drag or what I did out of drag. You know, no one cared about the behind the scenes. So that was my first kind of initiation into the world of, oh, this is me as a person and this is what I do. So it totally drastically changed my life and I was fascinated by the people that were fascinated with me in general, you know, which had never really happened before. And most of my drag friends don't even really kind of do interviews, the older queens that are friends of mine, um, don't really do interviews out of drag. Everything is usually this, but I think it definitely unmasked that side of drag that many people hadn't witnessed before. I want to ask you a little bit about that because I found an interview with you oh, from God. like 13 years ago, oh pre-drag race, okay. and one of the things you said that was so interesting, you said it's kind of like being Batman. Doing drag oh, is yeah. like being Batman because you have your day life and you have your night life yeah. and you get to have these two identities. But we know Bianca, yeah. but we also know Roy. Yeah. Is that still, do you still feel like Batman or, or are the lines between Bianca and Roy more fluid now? I think it's more fluid and I think that because of the exposure, it does change the world. You know, like you can be at the airport minding your own business, ready to get on a fly and a TSA agent's like, hey Bianca. And you're like, oh, hey, you know, and I'm just myself at the airport. So it is kind of funny that the identity is out there as what it is. So you have to accept that. You can't be mad about it. You know, you can't complain and go, oh, it's so dreadful that someone stopped me to say hello or to take a selfie. Uh, no, I mean, it's kind of amazing that someone even gives a shit. Um, so I'm impressed with all of that. So I, I think the lines get blurred, but I also know that when you're, you know, as I said, when I'm in the clown suit and I'm there to perform, I have a job to do, you know? So the packaging is always, enhances it, I should say, you know? Um, and so I still do that when I'm doing a show. For instance, Dead Inside, I'll be on the road. You're doing 
uh, a meet and greet before the show, which is like 200 people. You take photos with them and you get to interact with everyone and schmooze for a minute. And then you have the actual show, which works out great for me because usually the meet and greets are the first 20 rows of the audience. So if all else goes to shit, I've got those 20 people that I know who had on the stinky perfume, who's got the husband she hates, who didn't sleep last night. All of that then can get worked into the act. So my interactions with people are kind of blurred at the moment, but I'm not mad at that. I think I would have been scared of it uh, had I been much younger. But as an adult, I go, oh yeah, well this is my life, you yeah, know? because you came into it after doing it for so long. I want to ask you- Just say old, just no, say old. No. I came in it old. No, you came, old. You came into it as, as an adult. As with an adult. A, with wisdom and- Thank you experience. You You're do good at this. I you are good. I try. Who hated you today? Because <laughs> you are good at oh, this. Thank you. Thank you. There's, well, there's haters everywhere. Um, <laughs> but you also managed to keep the line between yourself. There has to be a line between your private self oh, and yeah. your public self. And your, your last book was not a memoir. Nope. It was very, very conspicuously advice. <laughs> Bianca giving advice. Mm -hmm. You know, RuPaul has another memoir coming out <laughs> in the spring that is going to be much more intimate about the early years. Have you thought about telling that story? No, okay. no one cares. <laughs> I listen, like RuPaul can write a book like that. RuPaul has lived a life, you know, and I think maybe in 20 years, I say, maybe I'd have a different tune, you know, but right now I go, I haven't done shit. You know, I did a reality show. Woohoo. I mean, I've done other stuff, but nothing that I could write that many pages about that many words. It's a commitment to write a book. And, and a, a publishing company come to me and said, would you like to do one? And I said, absolutely not about my life. And I have friends that have written books about their lives. Uh, well, kudos, good for you. Uh, mine wouldn't be that interesting. So I thought, let me give advice. You know, if we've got Dr. Phil in the world who is giving advice, <laughs> this bloated walrus who's got an opinion on everything, well, why can't I? So that's where I kind of came into it. And I thought, well, this is what I will do. If you're asking me for advice, let me give you the worst advice possible, or sometimes the best advice. Um, but I just don't think that my personal life is, I don't want to say that it's on display or that it, it just doesn't really matter. I don't want anyone to say, well, let's go buy a ticket to our show because so-and-so was an alcoholic. You know, like, I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? Um, and also, I think it's only fair that I leave all the dirt for my assistant to write after I'm dead. <laughs> That is extremely generous. Yeah, while well, you're laughing at the funeral, then just know that book is coming. <laughs> All right, I have two quick lightning round questions for you. You're not a hater, but you have said you don't like Taylor Swift. What have you got okay. against Taylor Swift? Okay, I can say that? this. I can say this publicly. I don't hate the girl at all. I like her a lot. I think very, very talented, very smart, got her shit together, you know, taken over the world. What I don't like is the people that like her. Does that make sense? It's the fanatical people. They make you hate the person because you're like, shut up, I know the song exists. Shut up, I know you're going to the concert. But that's with anybody. So I guess I hate fanatical people because it happens a lot with a Taylor Swift or with a Beyonce or with a Madonna or anybody who's t fabulous and touring at this point in their lives is that people make you hate them because of their behavior towards that person. I you know, it. I can look at it and go, I like Taylor Swift. I like this song, but I don't like that song and people lose their shit. How dare you? That's the part that I have an issue with. You know, we all can get a little criticism every now and then, you know? I think and everything's not my favorite, you know? I but I don't hate her. I don't hate her. Okay. She seems lovely. She, she seems, seems like a nice girl. Quick, she does. All right, one last lightning round question. Okay, well, that important. was lightning round. I went for 20 minutes. There's yeah, a lightning round of, of two questions. Um, you, I, send, I send a Not Today Satan meme at least once a week. As you should. At least once a week. I want to know, as, as a meme yourself, what was the last meme you sent? Oh my God, I'd have to check my phone, but I sent so many horror. Oh, oh, it was a really bad one. It was a really, it was a really bad one. Because uh, <laughs> you know, there's certain friends you can send them to. And it was, it was two photos of Mitch McConnell. <laughs> It was really funny because I hate Mitch McConnell and, and I, 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 this is not a political thing. This is a, a human thing. I hate Mitch McConnell. And here was the situation where it was him at the podium at two different times when he had those freezing moments and it said different strokes. And I couldn't because it was a show from the 80s. Yeah. So I laughed. And the reason why I laughed, people are going to say that's rude because this is an elderly person with health issues. Listen, I pay taxes and this son of a bitch <laughs> has got the best health care in the world, and none of us do in this country, so therefore I can make fun of him. So no matter what happens to him, he'll be taken care of. The rest of us, not so much. Not today, Satan. Not today, Satan. <laughs> not today. <laughs> Bianca, thank you so much for joining us today. Bianca Del Rio de Tour is called Dead Inside. Dead Inside. You may be dead inside, but you are very lively on the outside. Thank oh. you so much for joining us Please, today. Please, well, thank what you for pleasure. having me. And let's go find that hater. Let's go find let's her. Go find her. What'd she say?
Okay, please let me know. I want 